This video contains described video. The title of this panel is Perspectives on Birding and Ornithology from the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. The organizers include Lynn Brown and Alma Shoggy. The recording was made on August 9, 2023. The conference logo appears on the slide showing three birds flying over a bridge. The three birds are a piping plover, barn swallow, and green heron. Under this image are the words, birds as bridges, deaf and ornithology. Under that is an image of the sign for bridge in American Sign Language with a barn swallow flying by. The sign for bridge is shown with one hand extended straight with the palm flat and a second hand with the index and third finger shown almost as in a peace symbol touching at the bottom of the forearm with an arching motion from the tips of the fingers to the forearm. The title slide is also translated into French and indicates the location of the conference in London, Ontario, Canada. The conference was hosted by the American Ornithological Society and Society for Canadian Ornithologists. The slide also mentions that the recording was made with permission. The second slide states that the views and opinions expressed by the presenters and participants in this roundtable discussion are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or views of the American Ornithological Society. The roundtable discussion was recorded with permission from the American Ornithological Society under the terms and conditions of the American Ornithological Society and Society for Canadian Ornithologists 2023 conference and has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. Its appearance on the American Ornithological Society's website does not constitute an endorsement by the American Ornithological Society of the Roundtable's content. The panel setup. The video displays five screens showing the panel. In the top left screen is a side view of one of the interpreters who is giving close-up interpreting to a deaf-blind panelist. The second screen shows a wide shot of the panelists. There are three panelists and one moderator sitting in armchairs on the stage in front of the audience. From left to right are Hannah, a panelist, the moderator, Lynn, Alma, a panelist, and Wendy, a panelist. The third screen is a video of the second interpreter who is interpreting for the online virtual panelists. The fourth screen shows one of the panelists, Ron, against a plain background. The fifth screen shows Richard, another panelist, who is sitting inside a lodge-styled room. Throughout the recording, the panel setup stays the same. When an individual is speaking or signing, the camera zooms in to highlight that individual. All ready? Okay. Hey, thank you all for your patience today and joining the panel on deaf birders and ornithologists. My name is Lynn and I will be the moderator today. We have five panelists in different career stages and experiences, and we appreciate your patience. Uh, this is a remote and in-person meeting, and there may be time lags as we're changing the camera to different individuals. Uh, and we also have two interpreters and cart captioning. We'll start today with introductions and get into the discussions. So if Ron would like to introduce himself. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Ron uh, Papowski, and I was born and raised in a deaf family in Meadowlands, New Jersey. That's northern New Jersey. It's close to New York City. So growing up deaf with limited exposure to outside influences, I really grew up very interested in wildlife 
and um sorry the interpreter is just going to clarify and the wild kingdom it really just uh, interests me as I grew up So I started working at national parks early in my career in the Everglades uh, National Park, as well as Yellowstone National Park. And that's where I really became involved in birding. I went to Gallaudet University and did my BA in biology. I also worked for several agencies during my career, uh, as well as working in Patuxent, Wildlife Research Center, where we raised whooping cranes and sandhill cranes. After I graduated Gallaudet University, I got my first job working for the National Forest, and that was, uh, sorry, the National Forestry. And that was in Arizona. Then I later worked for the US Fishing and Wildlife Service. And that was for the last 22 years before I finally retired, just this past December. So it's really great to meet you all. Hi there, my name is Wendy. And my last name is Dunnels, and I grew up in Buffalo, New York. I became deaf at the age of 14 months. It was from spinal meningitis, so that's when I lost my hearing. I went deaf right away, and right away I was uh, immediately uh, enrolled in a deaf education, and that's, that's how I completed my full education. I have four sisters and four brothers, all of whom are hearing, as well as my parents. So growing up with a large family, with everyone who signed, um, also being able to see wildlife through the windows in my family home. I, I just recall having those large windows and being able to see the birds outside. And that's where I really got interested in, in birds at that time. So I went to the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, uh, and that's where I work as a professor and a research faculty. So I'm a very serious bird watcher. That's actually how I describe myself. Richard, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thank you, Lynn, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Richard Prum, and I'm an ornithologist and evolutionary biologist. Uh, I guess I would uh, consider myself to be in the, uh, the, the senior career stage in our panel today. Um, I started bird watching as a child at about 10. Uh, and became very interested in combining bird watching with ornithology. Um, my uh, hearing loss, uh, well, my bird watching was always very aural, and my, you know, my eyes were never uh, perfect. So I, hearing birds was a big part of both my birding and my research on on behavior. My dissertation was on mannequins in in South America. Um, I started losing my hearing in 1987 in Senegal, um, in West Africa, where I had a sudden idiopathic hearing loss in my right ear. Five or six years later, I developed Meniere's disease in my left ear, which eventually progressed over a decade uh, to completely um, removing that ear. So right now I'm monaural with one ear, but with a sensitivity only below about 1200 hertz. And as I age, uh, it's actually becoming less sensitive even in different. So I identify as, I guess, as uh, uh, hearing disabled, uh, but it's a kind of a, 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 a privilege to learn about others in ornithology and to be included in, in today's panel. So um, um, 
that's what I can say. Thanks. Alma? Um, I'm Alma Shraki. I am a biologist for the United States Geological Survey. I work primarily with pollinators, specifically endangered species such as the rusty patch bumblebee. However, before that, I graduated from college. I planned to be an ornithologist, and I did four years of field work with various ornithology field projects, such as raptor banding with Hawkwatch International and also in Cape May. And I also did raptor counting. I did passing banding uh, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and again in Cape May, and a little bit in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And I also did a limited amount of point count surveys in the Sierra Nevada, and also behavioral studies of phenol peplos in the Mojave Desert. So that combined with pollinator work. And after four years, I went to grad school to get my master's focused primarily on rusty patch bumblebee. And now I'm working for USGS primarily as a pollinator ecologist. So uh, I was born deaf uh, to a family of hearing parents, hearing siblings. I use ASO and I also use English. And um, I identify as deaf and uh, I conducted bird work for four years as a profoundly deaf person and did adjustments that way. So, mm hmm Hannah? Hi, my name is Hannah De, De Feliz. This is my sign name. I am deaf blind. And what does that really mean? I am deaf, and at the same time, I am legally blind. I think I'm the earliest in my career here on the panel. I'm in my fourth year undergraduate studies. I'm a science major at RIT. I did grow up using ASL. I did uh, attend both deaf schools and mainstream schools. However, I did use ASL. So the first question is how deaf people do birding. How is it different than uh, your hearing counterparts? Wendy? Well, I grew up in a hearing family, a non-deaf family, so as I compare my experience with them, for example, when we would go on family trips, camping, or do anything in wildlife, for example, going to Point Pelee National Park, and that's here in Canada, actually, it's quite a famous area for bird migration, so on Mother's Day every year in the beginning of May, uh, it is quite a famous hotspot for bird migration, so With my family being very familiar that I am deaf and needing more visual cues, they would get my attention and, and direct my attention to what they were seeing if they wanted to let me know. It is a definite different experience when I work with non-deaf people who are really not familiar with what it is I need. Um, having deaf, being deaf helps me be a lot more visually skilled and I'm able to catch things a lot easier. So I'm able to see things um, that some people may miss and I can see it quite faster. And it's almost a trade-off really for, for what I can't, uh, what, what my teammates can't hear, I can see and vice versa. So it's a good balance. Mm -hmm. So like Wendy, my birding is very visual. I did a lot of work with raptors, which fortunately are not very vocal. So that is kind of an easy one. And I would say that maybe to some extent, I'm more sensitive to visual information than many people. 
And then also IHS, when I'm birding for fun, for example, I like to look for warblers in the spring before first leaf. That's my favorite time because you can do a lot more visual burden for warblers at that time compared to the fall. And then in my work, there are sometimes aspects where I did need to do some auditory birding. And there's a lot of technology that can be used for that. So I actually relied on spectrograms that visualize bird sound. And this is before AI image recognition was really a thing, maybe seven years ago. I just learned to recognize the sound you know, by memory. This is what Wilson's warbler looks like. This is what warbler and furious look like. And I found that I was pretty much on par with most hearing birders for recognition, if given the opportunity to practice and learn like hearing birders do, so. So I have this, a similar experience to Alma. I use a lot of technology. I do use that AI uh, recognition technology. It really helps me identify which bird I am seeing currently. So typically I go birding with other people. I have a few deaf friends that I do like to go with. So we have a method of describing where birds are amongst us. So they will actually draw on my back to help me visualize uh, where they are seeing the birds so that I can look in that specific area and then identify that bird. So Ron is saying, most of my experience was when I was working independently. So I typically focused on larger birds, for example, hawks, water birds, and shore birds. Those tend to be the easiest to see. But when I work with owls, for example, I would need to work with a non-deaf partner. And that would be the easiest way uh, to find owls, because as you might know, you have to rely on sound to find them. For some other birds, I can work independently, but specific ones that make, make use of auditory calls, that's where I, I need to work with a hearing partner. Richard, is there anything you'd like to add? Sure. Um, uh, as a uh, uh, as a, a, a person who become hearing impaired later, or in you know in my twenties and further on, um, I had already developed all my birding skills and methods. I was very visual, but also very acoustic, and would find things. And um, had done you know big days of over two hundred birds with a very majority of them. Um, you know, heard only. And so um, for me, it's really been, uh, uh, was a great difficulty to try to figure out how to uh, bird watch again and, and, and always relying uh, on others. And for me, uh, one thing that has been really great is the development and the continuing improvement of uh, transposing hearing aids. In particular, uh, Phonak produces a, a hearing aid with what they call uh, audibility extender that transposes some set of frequencies down to uh, some other range. Um, so I can hear warblers for the first time in uh, you know 30 years. Um, what is uh, or 25 anyway? What what is uh, difficult, of course, is that uh, if you imagine the sound of a piccolo and a flute. Uh, a clarinet uh, and a trumpet all transposed down to the frequency of a tuba uh, or a bassoon. 
uh, you take all that dynamic range and condense it so they're all singing in the same way and so that makes you have to relearn the songs in a, in a second time however i still uh, cannot localize where the sound might be uh from where i am so that makes finding birds uh hard and uh relying on others is um is uh, essential but um you know uh, um you're always uh, 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 um, working to try to see if you could get that, uh, find that bird on your own. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very, very tough. What sort of barriers have you experienced with your bird jobs and birding in general? Um, I will say that just in general, as I started out as an early career ornithologist, there were a couple of barriers. One was, even though I had the technology to be doing auditory bird recognition, the whole concept of it was so novel to people that it was never really considered as a potentially valid way to do point count and that sort of thing. So basically automatically 50% of field jobs were a no-go for me because there was no way I could convince someone that I could do it, even though I was able to demonstrate it because it's just such a novel way to be doing bird recognition. If I had stayed in ornithology, I probably could have pursued something with autonomous recording units because that is becoming a very huge thing now. And as an undergraduate, I did a lot of sound analysis with Raven Pearl, so I was actually very familiar with the earlier aspects of the ARU technologies. That said, I really like field work, and I didn't want to be in, computer all over, in front of a computer all day, so I found that pollinators were more kind of let me do that without experiencing the barriers I experienced in ornithology as a deaf person. Um, the other big thing was conferences. Uh, most conferences don't realize that in the U.S. at least they're legally obliged by law to provide interpreters. And I was denied interpreters for conferences I attended as an undergraduate and as a graduate student. And that is pretty off-putting for academic career, which is partially why I am now a government scientist, because they are 100% on top of their legal obligations access wise. So. One of the biggest barriers that I've experienced personally is people's attitudes towards me yeah. and their other people's judgments based on, on what they think I can do. So for example, when I first started college, people assumed that I couldn't do lab science. They thought, uh, a blind person in a lab, that can't be safe. There's no way we can let that happen. And she's, and I was saying, absolutely, I can. It just needs to be adapted for my needs. So I ended up transferring schools. Now I go to RIT, which has a, a massive deaf population there. So that's when those attitudes kind of uh, improved uh, towards me when I did uh, transfer to RIT. But I have noticed that many jobs in this field do require that you uh, drive or that you can hear, which is obviously a barrier. And people just aren't open-minded to adapting or changing the way that things are typically done. And that's the biggest barrier that I've experienced so far. So I'll make my comment short. If you hear us chatting about 
our struggles and you're wondering how you can support us as hearing people, the best thing that you can do is ask us what it is we need. That's the best way to get any kind of guidance for how you can support us and how you can start removing barriers. So yeah, that's, that's the best thing you can do. Ron or Richard? Ron is raising his hand. So most of my challenges and my experiences were related to learning opportunities. So for example, webinars or any kind of video presentation or virtual lecture any through any kind of media, uh, it typically includes captions, but depending on which platform you use, for example, using YouTube, they're usually pretty good uh, if they have included closed caption, as YouTube does have an auto caption feature. But there are several other platforms that can be used for webinars that sometimes don't include captions. So providing that kind of universal design where I could be joining any time that I choose rather than uh, you know having to contact organizers or get involved at a really early planning stage in order to have accessibility provided. So I do believe that all learning opportunities, webinars or anything through technology or media should be automatically provided with at least closed captions. Um, there's been a lot of improvements over the last few years, but I hope to see, you know, 100% accessibility. I would like to have the same choices as my non-deaf counterparts to be able to join whenever I choose. Richard? Um, I I'm uh, can say that I haven't faced uh, uh, institutional uh, barriers or other in in my pursuit of my career, but I have uh, faced real serious uh, uh, challenges in my research itself, uh, reorienting my research around topics that um, are not uh, too challenging or impossible uh, to pursue anymore. Um, and and you know that has uh, that has led to research programs I didn't expect, uh, but it certainly has uh, been a, 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 a challenge and an adjustment. So we've touched on the barriers, but are there good examples of deaf gain that you've experienced with birding? Wendy? Like I said, I'm more of a serious bird watcher, but when I do, uh, my, my family is large. And when we do get together, you know, typically my siblings and parents and everyone are everywhere and we're, we're watching. And what I do notice is that with hearing people and my hearing family, if we're able to sign to each other across far distances, we're able to not disturb the birds. And so that is something that's really incredible, uh, being deaf and using sign language, that we can just keep quiet and not disturb any of our amazing opportunities. Um, I would say that in my years as both as a graduate student, now as a biologist, and also during field work, I was in a crew leader capacity. I often had to coordinate multiple people, sometimes in remote areas of like the Sierra Nevada mountain. So safety was a big issue. And I found that as a deaf field scientist, I was generally more on top of things like what's the plan? Where's everyone going to go? Does everyone know where everyone else is going, what they're doing? And just basically 
I was a better communicator in some ways because I didn't take communication for granted. And I thought ahead about, you know, what could go wrong? How can I prevent that from happening? So I feel like a lot of the field safety things that we now do today, but we weren't doing maybe five, 10 years ago, I was doing that earlier than most people. I had similar experiences to Alma again. I, I do tend to think about safety a lot more than a hearing sighted person might. I do have one skill that most hearing sighted people don't have. I can communicate in the dark. <laughs> With no noise because I can use a tactile sign language, so. So I have uh, had experiences where I go with friends to bird watch or watch animals and we need to stay quiet or it's quiet and it's dark, but you know, our group of friends, we're still able to communicate perfectly and that's not a problem. So that is an experience that I have that uh, other people may not have. Ron or Richard? Hi, um, I, I um, can say that, uh, although I wouldn't call it a, a, a gain or advantage, I do know that the knowledge that I uh, built when I could hear birdsong is still useful. So I grew up in New England and learned a, a tremendous amount of birdsong in elementary school, right? So those birds are really you know, uh, deeply embedded in my brain. So when I run into uh, uh, birds who are unfamiliar or having trouble with a song, they'll be describing it. And I say, well, you know, you can tell, um, uh, you know, hooded warbler from Magnolia by uh, uh, this or that feature and, and imitate the sound. Uh, uh, and so I can help them try to identify bird songs that I can't hear. Uh, and, and they'll be like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's what that is. And, 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 and be, uh, move on it. Right. Uh, uh, or describe a bird that, that, uh, and try to, you know, uh, fill it. So, so some of those, uh, uh, those songs are still deeply embedded. No, I don't have anything to add on that one. Okay. Given what we've discussed so far, are there concrete steps that the American Ornithological Society can take to help bridge the gap between the hearing researchers and deaf ones? Um, so first off, I think I would really like to see more advances in conference accessibility. So there's a couple of challenges with that. The main one is uh, often deaf researchers are somewhat more expensive to accommodate than many other disabled scientists because we use interpreters, we use captioners. This is often a significant financial output for conferences. So I would like to see a more unified offered by conferences and professional organizations in terms of allocating funding for the four conferences and maybe pooling funding for multiple conferences or partnering between different professional organizations. So that way, when a deaf scientist, especially early career ones, you know, if they want to attend a large annual conference like this or a small specialist conference, the funds are there for them to, you know, assess it. And we're a pretty small percentage of the population. So, you know, just 
having a central source of funding available for multiple conferences would really, you know, go a long way towards improving accessibility. And it's just really off-putting early in your career to go to a conference and not be able to get, you know, legally mandated accommodations. It's a pretty, no matter what the conference says, it's a pretty clear communication that you're not wanted there and, you know, you should pursue a career elsewhere. So I would like to see more advances on that front. I have a few comments related to this. So if you're working with uh, an activity or an event that would include kids, or you're making it a website or anything like that, deaf children uh, typically are behind in science because kids don't enjoy just sitting down and reading. So all the kids' TV shows, movies, things, uh, media that focuses on science, they don't have interpreters. And children, they can't read the captions that may be provided on screen. So already they're entering the education system a little bit behind in science. So if you're working with kids or you're creating something that involves kids or high school students. Please try to invite deaf and disabled kids to those events as well. Please actively go out and try and, and find deaf and disabled individuals or children that may want to attend your events. So those, those opportunities when people do create uh, those events for kids, really they're not accessible to deaf children usually. And if you're working in a university or academic field, please make your labs open to uh, deaf or disabled individuals as well. Sure, it requires a little bit more work on your part, but it is important for people to be involved. I know for myself, so for myself personally, I never saw myself working in the science field until there was a professor who invited me to work with her. And then I was like, oh, maybe this is something that I would be interested in. So uh, those opportunities for deaf and disabled people are really important in uh, early career opportunities. Ron or Richard? Um, okay. <clears throat> I just want to say really quickly that when you encounter early career deaf or hard of hearing or deaf blind scientists in college and grad school, presume competent presume ability, just remember that maybe you have to adjust or do things a little differently. But, you know, I think Ron, me, and Hannah all demonstrate we can do the field work. It's often the social aspect, the networking, that's where the challenges and the barriers arise. Yep, Ron's raising his hand. So I guess I can add a little bit uh, just regarding technology. We have seen some improvements in technology that have really <clears throat> helped us to hear birds through uh, applications or devices and other technology. And so it is important to keep in mind that it's a not, a not a one size fits all solution. Uh, everyone has different needs, different levels of hearing loss. Um, some people can see some things, some people can't. 
Some people are profoundly deaf. For example, myself, I'm profoundly deaf. And so I do need devices or apps to help me hear things, but it doesn't really benefit me. <clears throat> I would like to see some new technology that would apply to people who have profound deafness or profound hearing loss. I haven't seen one or tried one yet. So I would like to see some something developed by working with deaf professionals with deaf scientists to have us involved in the development of a technology that would potentially benefit our work. Wendy? <clears throat> I'm just waiting for the camera to be on me before I go ahead. I did want to add to what Ron had commented, because myself, I am an engineer. So when you develop new projects or different types of services, <clears throat> it is so important that in those development stages um, that you re remember, if you want to develop something that will help people with disabilities, that's great and that is noble. Uh, but it is important to have those people involved in the development stages, in that creative stage, to provide their feedback on how, you know, it could truly benefit them. They have that lived experience. And unfortunately, that perspective is typically added, you know, too little, too late, near the end of, of development. And those are, it's kind of a band-aid situation at that point. It should be where the people with lived experience are involved at the beginning in the planning stages in order to get their perspective. <clears throat> because like, for example, having them involved in, um, in, a, in a testing stage, for example, if there was an app that gave uh, a sound locator as well, just to let us know which direction the sound is coming from that would definitely help benefit uh, my bird watching for sure. And I would say, you know, reach out to deaf technology hubs like Rochester Institute of Technology or Gallaudet University. That is where there's a large concentration of deaf talent, scientists, researchers, students. And so, you know, you really want to make sure you're working with a community you're trying to include. And it's much, much easier to plan access if you do it early and not at the last minute. And it generally doesn't work at the last minute. So, yeah. I just want to add to that comment. So this comment is uh, related more to blindness than deafness. So if you are creating an app or technology like that, make sure that you have a blind person test out the app on the screen. Right. Oh, test, sorry, have a test, a deaf uh, or a blind person uh, test the app with a screen reader because so often. The person who created that app may think that they've made it accessible and that it may work for a blind person, but it just doesn't. And, and really, if you don't have a blind person test out that technology, you're excluding a whole group of people that could also benefit from that new technology. With Ron or Richard. Ron said, no, all good. Hi. Um, it, it seems like... Um a sound uh, locator would be a real technological uh, addition, especially given uh, artificial intelligence uh, birdsong identification 
which is uh, so well placed. And um, uh, it would be great to see a, uh, you know, uh, uh, Cornell Lab, uh, RIT, Gallaudet uh, collaboration to, to, to add that. It would enhance uh, many people's uh, field capacity to, to understand not only when species, a certain species has been recorded, but what direction it might be. That could also be um, connected to some kind of haptic device that would give blind uh, or hearing or sight impaired people directionality as well, right? Uh, it's behind you in front or high, how high, et cetera. So that sounds like something that would be really uh, 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 useful for, 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 for all of us. So I think we have time for a couple of questions if anyone in the audience has any. Yeah. If maybe you want to yeah. take uh you can face the audience or the panelists here and just speak loudly. I was just wondering, um, from a field safety perspective, um, I noticed that uh, you all talked about birding with team, friends, um, what other you know, um, facilities or infrastructure will help? First them? audience question clarified. What field safety considerations do deaf birders practice? What information and resources are available that could benefit deaf communities? Now, I'm just thinking from the field safety perspective, it really depends on the person in question. So for example, I wear hearing aids, so I can hear a lot of environmental sound, not the quiet one, but you know, I probably could hear gunshots or a dog's barking. So I do have some auditory information for safety. I can't understand human speech, so it does make it hard for me to communicate with people in the field. But for example, there's an organization called Field Inclusive, and they do a lot of really great work focused on field safety. And some of the things are, for example, stickers with the university logo that you can put on to the outside of a car or that you can remove because sometimes it's safer not to be visible in the field. And so stuff like that helps me as well, just because if I'm wearing official regalia that you know people are less likely to assume that I'm up to something suspicious. So, um, but, so far, I've been lucky, uh, and I would say that I extend to a lot of hearing people I know in the field, as I'm sure all of you have had your close calls in field work, and I think in general, I have not been, you know, any less safe than my hearing colleagues. It's, you know, a lot, one thing I've gotten is like, how do you avoid stepping on rattlesnakes if you can't hear them? And well, one, you can wear a rattlesnake guard. Two, you can watch where you step, which um, I have had hearing coworkers step on rattlesnake and I have not. So I think there's a unfair bias in terms of whether I am safer or not in the field. And you know, sometimes it's safer not to hear something. For example, I had a coworker, she heard an animal outside her tent at night and she turned on her light and it was a moose and the light startled and it stampeded to a campground of 20 people and woke everyone up. So I would not have heard it and the moose would have gone on its way and you know, we wouldn't have woken up 20 people. And thankfully no one was hurt, but uh, you know, so it's sort of, it's not clear to me that deaf people are consistently less safe in the field. You know, it's kind of a toss of the coin. And something I think all field biologists deal with is dignity of risk is there is a certain amount of risk when you do these activities. It is your choice to do that or not? And 
we should be extending dignity of risk to all researchers in the field. It should be up to them whether they want to engage in these risks or not. You know, you would not forbid a queer person or a person of color from doing field work just because of the dangers involved. So why does it apply to a disabled scientist? So that's my rhetorical question for you. I would love to respond to that question also. I do have uh, experience with field work and I have also hiked half of the Appalachian Trail all by myself. Oh, myself and my dog, sorry, interpreter. Was from the cable body. And the only time in all of that experience, the, the only time I felt threatened was when I came across an able-bodied person. And that able-bodied person meant me harm. So that threat, I didn't feel like it was from being outside, being in the field, from my research. I didn't feel a threat from that. So I just ask that you be open-minded. If, if I'm planning to do something, ask me how I plan to do it. I have trained my dog to recognize certain things. And if, if he recognizes something that I haven't, he will let me know. I, I really don't feel like my safety... Uh, my safety is lowered because I'm a deafblind individual compared to somebody who is able-bodied. Mm -hmm. I'm saying no, nope, all good. Nothing to add. Any other questions? Hi, um, I was just wondering if um, an organization wanted to create an outreach event or program that was more inclusive um, to non-hearing people, where would be a good place to advertise that and reach the deaf community? So you asked an excellent question because deaf people typically they have you know their ways of how news gets out in the community um so typically you know the answer is there's a page on facebook for your local area or a local deaf club that could advertise for you and so these are some of the ways that we will use and it is area specific. And you'll definitely have to get in touch with local deaf individuals in your area to ask what the best way to, to get the news out. Like for, if, if we're comparing, you know, here in this community or a different community, it's, it, you've definitely got to ask the deaf individuals in your community. And uh, I will say it's just, the vast majority of community events, science events are usually not accessible. And so what Wendy says about reaching out to the deaf community to advertise is kind of important because unless you are explicitly reaching out, we usually will assume that it's not going to be accessible. And there's a lot of energy, time in trying to figure out if something's going to be accessible or not. So often it's just like, you know, why should I bother when I could just be reading it instead? So, um, and also I think, I'm sure Hannah could contribute to this from the blind perspective, but I think just basic closed captioning, make sure your Zoom webinars are captioned. And something I would really like to see at conferences is most of you use PowerPoint. It takes 30 seconds to go on, turn on the automatic captions in the PowerPoint application. And that is a very easy free way to provide 
not perfect caption, but still better than nothing. And, you know, but most people don't know it exists. And there is a really strong inertia when it comes to accessibility. It's just like, oh, it's overwhelming. It's complicated. I don't have the energy for it because we're all scientists who are burning the midnight oil with, you know, publisher parish and that. So it's just, you know, try to do more small steps. And then when you want to do bigger step, do the research beforehand. Ron saying no, nothing to add. Any other questions? Oh, thanks. Uh, we're, we're working with a group called Birdability, and I wanted to know if you'd heard of them, but they strive to make uh, birding accessible for visually orally challenged um, wheelchair users and other groups. And in, in that same light, I wanted to ask, I know they have a map of places that they've reviewed and have put up as uh, places that would be friendly to different groups. Do you use any apps? Or are there any other tools that you use where it would be helpful to have information in terms of say advertising or making, a, making people aware of activities or, and are there any other special tools that you recommend? They, they have some recommendations for using iPads, for example, with headphones. Um, so it's just curious about other tools you might benefit from. Um, I will say that, you know, for the most part, the barriers we face aren't with the landscape itself, you know, it's not physical accessibility. So I'm not really sure how, you know, the work birdability does is great and valuable, but I don't really, you know, kind of type the Appalachian Trail half of it. So it's not really a sense of geography, it's more the social aspect of accessibility that we experience so when we're in hearing spaces that's where we experience the most friction and so i would say you know just be aware of organizations that do good accessibility work so some are atomic hands they do science communication in asl they're led by alicia wooten and barbara speaker they are both scientists, um, I think one at Gallaudet, and I don't know where Barbara is currently, but, and then also Corpse That, which is another great nonprofit that works on basically creating a critical mass of signing deaf people in early career spaces in field work. I can email them later. Okay. Yeah. Corp. Cor. Wendy's saying, I think, let's just confirm the spelling. Yeah. Oh. Corp that. C O R P T H A T. Corp that. Yeah. In oh, C O R P S. T H A T yeah. corpse that in English is C O R P S T H A T corpse that, and then the second one atomic hand. So atomic hands. Another thing I think would be helpful uh, would ha be having a resource list. Uh, so that resource list may relate to mentors are, or REU programs uh, and giving them a resource list of how do you request an interpreter for somebody. It, in that way, then it's not the student's responsibility to be teaching um, how to create an accessible space. Yeah. 
Uh, so if there was a resource list created like that, it might help out some people who do want to create an accessible space and aren't sure how, and that might get them started. And I will add that, you know, deafness is a disability, but it's also a linguistic identity we sign. And so it's often helpful to think about the approaches you use for bilingual access, you know, increasing bilingual access to the sciences. Those approaches are the kind of approaches that you apply to deaf community as well. So that's sort of having interpreters, having a critical mass of language users together in the same space so they can learn from one another and learn from role models. So that's sort of something to think about. Just do a slight frame shift when you're thinking about what accessibility means for the deaf community. That concludes our time here today. I'd like to thank the American Ornithological Society for hosting this and providing funding for the interpreters and cart captioning that you see here today and give a large round of applause for the panelists for sharing all of their information. And it's just saying thank you so much.